Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our monthly KISA webinar. Uh, this webinar series are designed for KISA members and other interested parties, and of course, they are free to attend. Um, just to let you know, the webinars are recorded and they are made available at the KISA YouTube channel, which we recommend that you all subscribe to. And the title to this webinar presentation is titled The Heart of the Hospital. And this presentation's main focus is about sterility assurance in the hospital. In this webinar, the speakers will explain what is sterility assurance, um, why it is important in the hospital environment, why it is an emergency concern, and what we can do to relieve the current situation. We have uh, speakers who will address this issue, and they are from Medclave. Uh, the first one is Yuanita Hoffman, and we also have Shane Taylor. Yuanita Hoffman joined Medclave in 2020 as part of the servicing team. Although she is still in the infant stage of her career, she has since moved to the sales and marketing team, where she now leads the team as the sales and marketing manager. Shane Taylor has been with Medicleave since 2008 and is the head of technical operations at Medicleave. Uh, before I hand over the microphone, I'd like to um, just explain the rules of engagement. Uh, please keep your microphone muted at all times during the presentation to avoid background noise. Uh, you can also keep your videos off to reduce the bandwidth so we can have good quality connection. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, please type your question in the chat bubble or use the Q&A chat box to type all your questions. At the end of the presentation, we shall ask the speakers to address the questions and comments. So I hand over now to Ioannita Hoffman for the presentation. Perfect, thank you so much, Tim, for the introduction. I just want to confirm that everybody can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Then I'm going to go ahead. Um, so afternoon, everybody. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to address the importance of sterility assurance, what it is, why it's an emerging concern, and in addition, what we can do to relieve the situation. I'm going to start with the illustration on the screen. Um, is there a difference between these two devices? So visually, the answer will be no, there's no difference. But in fact, the one is actually sterile. The point that I'm trying to make is sterility cannot be identified by the naked human eye, therefore making it very difficult for CSSD to release a sterile load. So let's go into a little bit more detail. What is sterilization? Sterilization is the elimination of all transmissible agents from surfaces and or equipment. Alternatively, as I like to refer to it as the battle against the bugs. Sterilization is a probability as it cannot yet be proven. So uh, sterility assurance levels measures the chance of microorganisms surviving the sterilization process as a one to six log reduction that shows the amount of percentage of live microbes eliminated after sterilization. Standard healthcare requirements is a six log reduction and sometimes an overkill of an eight log reduction is also required. There are many different ways to form sterility. Um, some are steam sterilization, hydrogen peroxide or plasma, ethylene oxide, formaldehyde, and many more. With that said, I cannot state which is the best. I believe each has their pros and cons, their advantages and disadvantages, and uh, each to their own, or as we know it, forces for forces. For now, I would like to uh, attend to um, shifting your minds and uh, mind shift to rather equipment and what their object is to sterility assurance. Why is sterility assurance important? Because currently the bugs are winning. 
Antimicrobial resistance was directly and indirectly responsible for the elimination of 5 million or so deaths in 2019. And soon, by 2050, up to 10 million deaths could occur annually. So just to put that into perspective, uh, Loftus Fairchild Stadium can take up to 50,000 people. And if you work it out, that's 200 Loftus Fairchild Stadiums each year. Um, being killed by antimicrobial resistance. You can clearly see in the figure where we are at, which is a small amount here at the bottom, and then where we are heading is the larger bit here. I have linked the report uh, for all the antimicrobial resistance details that I have drawn. It was drawn from the United Nations uh, Superbug report. And I do encourage each and every individual to download the report and to go and read uh, what it is about uh, antibiotic resistance and so forth. It is really applicable to each individual and not only hospital sectors. So Inga Anderson stated in one of her um, submissions in the United Nations report the following. Antimicrobials are an essential part of modern life. Yet, the more we use them inappropriately, the more microbial world adapts. There's a strong evidence that bacteria, parasites, viruses, and fungi are becoming resistant to antimicrobials. Infections in humans, animals, and plants are becoming difficult, sometimes impossible, to treat. Antimicrobial resistance has therefore become an emerging, uh, emerging principal public health problem. However, it is closely linked to poverty, lack of sanitation, poor hygiene, and pollution. Therefore, low income and lower middle class income countries will be drastically affected. So in the um, figure, you can see Africa will largely be affected because unfortunately we are the lower income um, country as well as continent. So who is responsible? The three main uh, sectors that are responsible will be agricultural and foods, because obviously they're putting um, antibiotics in animals, uh, your food processing and so forth. Your second sector will be healthcare delivery and then pharmaceuticals and other chemicals. The last figure is a clear indication of antibiotics being developed between 2015, uh, 2010 and 2015, and already in 2020 to 25, the resistance is stepping in. So that's not a long period after that resistance is already coming in. So this all sounds like doom and gloom and that the apocalypse is coming for us. However, there's always a, a solution to this. CSSD the only hospital department licensed to kill. I just want to say that again, the only hospital department licensed to kill. How can one be sure that the CSSD has killed sufficiently? As previously stated, the reality is not visually um, visible. So it's difficult to see that CSSD has uh, sterilized efficiently. For this reason, sterilized insurance products are crucial in CSSD. A hospital can never be better than its CSSD. And where a hospital perceives to be better than its CSSD, we are in effect killing our patients and not the bugs. A few hospitals have learned that it is cheaper to invest in um, infection control than to deal with the consequences of infection. These hospital CSSDs are often kept up to date with technology, um, standards, even the layout of a CSSD. A few sterility insurance products are the commonly known Bioidic test bag, your type 4 long indicator, your type 4 short indicator, uh, the type 5 integrator, um, even your uh, type 6 emulators, the well-known biological indicators, and many more. So let's look at the history of sterility assurance products. 
The helix is not a new test method as it has been used since 1973 to test steam penetration on the inside of instruments and tubes. The Bowie-Dick test pack is also not a new test me method. It was developed in 1963 for testing whether a steam sterilizer could effectively sterilize cotton or linen packs. Two very different tests for te testing different parameters. Since 2001, the WFHSS Congress, experts in the field of validation and engineering of steam sterilizers question the valid validity of Bowie-Dick test packs. They suggested that the Helix device, the PCD, or the process challenge device, should start replacing the commonly known Bowie-Dick test pack. The logic behind this was the hospitals are not, not only sterilizing uh, linen or cotton packs anymore. At the same time, the loads of steam sterilizers in hospitals have changed dramatically. So uh, that's when the lumens started coming in, the endoscopes, all the hollow objects. So a standard biodic test pack would not be able to get into um, hollow instruments. Today, the challenge of the steam sterilizers are these kind of complex, narrow lumen instruments. It is all about whether the steam sterilizer can effectively remove all the air and replace it with steam inside the hollow object. If you do not get the steam out, if you do not get the air out, you cannot get the steam in. So let's look. I'm going to start with the Bowie. Um, I'm going to work through each uh, sterility assurance product but I'm gonna start with the Bowie Dick test pack. And there are four different types. We all know the Bowie Dick test pack. Uh, it's used in most of the hospitals in South Africa. It's for porous loads only. It's used in a hospital sterilizer and it's for single use. And then the next one is the Bowie Dick Helix test. It's for hollow loads only, also used in hospital sterilizers and it can be used for 500 cycles. I just want to, before I carry on with the rest, the 500 cycles is your PCD um, and your indicators. Your indicators are 500 indicators and they are placed into your PCD. So your PCD can only be used for 500 cycles. So once they have been um, used and they are complete and you need to order a new set, you can't only order the indicators, the PCD, um, the pouch and the indicators is a whole set. So that gets thrown away and a new set gets taken out. Uh, continuing to the Bowie Dick Helix test, the stainless steel version. It's for porous loads and hollow loads used in the hospital sterilizer, also for 500 cycles. And then your batch control helix test is also tested for porous loads and hollow loads used in your hospital sterilizers for 500 cycles. Uh, just to give you a definition of porous loads, it is minute spaces or holes through which air may pass. So a sponge is a good way to look at a porous um, item. Then hollow loads is having a hollow or empty space inside. So CSSD should select the correct biodic test pack on the type of load. So porous load, you'll use your biodic test pack. And for hollow loads, you'll use your biodic helix test. However, the problems with this is most CCSDs don't have a set load. They have mixed loads. The second problem is two biodic test packs at the same time influence each other. And the third problem is if you jump between the biodic test pack and your biodic helix test pack, you'll lose a capacity of 20%, um, which you could have used to maybe sterilize an object. So the use of a stainless steel biodic helix test is uh, tested to perform the original biodic test pack and is more stringent than the normal helix test pack. So the stainless steel um, biodic helix test will replace both the biodic test pack as well as your biodic helix test. It tests for porous loads and hollow loads. So it's one test that you'll use 
instead of having to use both of these tests. Advantages are test both load types, as I've just mentioned. It's no need for additional tests. It's most cost effective and reliable and more problem deviations. Ideally, a hospital should validate all loads and combination of loads, although this is not practical as a combination of loads vary every cycle. A most difficult to sterilize object by means of a helix is not only advised to be used as a biodic test pack, but also as a cycle monitoring uh, device. So here you can see why we refer to it as the most difficult one. It tests most of your parameters. But why have PCDs been conceived to be unreliable in the past? We can show interesting cases from experience that staff have a higher belief in their technical engineers and their steam sterilizers respectively more than their chemical indicators. With that in mind, we all want our indicators to show a pass. Once a BCD shows a failure, so once your helix device shows a failure, CSSD usually makes the following remarks. The leak test is okay. The biodic test pack is okay. The technical engineer says it's okay. The biological indicator is negative, which is okay. So only the PCD is giving a wrong result, often concluding that the indicator is not working correctly. But bear in mind, a leak test is run on an empty sterilizer. A biodic test pack is run on an empty sterilizer. A test run by the technical engineer is run by an empty sterilizer, and your biological indicator is killed in just 0.7 minutes at 134 degrees. In the beginning, steam sterilizer manufacturers were also objecting to the helix. It was showing failures, where the printer recording of the parameters were showing no failures. We all know that running the biodic test pack is done without a load, as another one or a load may influence your test result. An interesting aspect, however, and this is that once a failure is detected by the batch control uh, helix device, all other proof shows that there's nothing wrong with the steam sterilizer. This is based upon tests performed without a load. So the illustration is uh, quite clear. Uh, the empty sterilizer is the one here on the left. It can be compared to a truck going maybe on a tar road. It's driving 180 kilometers an hour. The fuel consumption is great and it's cruising smoothly with an empty load. However, if you have a full autoclave load, it can be compared to the one on the right. It's heavily loaded, going uphill, only going 90 kilometers an hour. Your fuel consumption is next to nothing. Uh, it's a full load and it's going tough. So that's a good illustration between an empty sterilizer as well as a full sterilizer. So on the left, that is the Bowie testing here, whereas your PCD is testing here. The Helix device is usually, uh, usually picks up failures before test methods and even before technical engineers can. In Germany, the Helix device for biodic and batch monitoring is in use for over 25 years. And in Holland, Dutch hospitals have been using Helix devices as a biodic and batch control since 2004. Since 2009, the EN285 and Extra A2 is recommending the use of a Helix as an alternative for the biodic test pack which is mainly sterilizing instruments. Why is the Helix becoming more and more popular is not a surprise given the many failures it can detect. EN285 2015 is now the current standard and the latest version and supersedes the old EN285 2006, A2 2009. So the latest one is the 2015 version. But what does the standard say about PCDs? 
The batch control helix is based upon um, EN 285 standard that describes the process challenging device to consist out of a chemical indicator holder, a cap connected to a 1.5 meter PTFD tube with a two millimeter diameter. Uh, sorry, the two millimeter diameter is the inner diameter. It's not the outer or the cap size. It's the um, device, the, the pipe of the device. That's the two millimeter. Yeah. The standards are very specific about the construction, material, length, uh, even the volume of the cap for the hollow PCD. So a device with a tube length of only 25 centimeters can hardly be considered a challenge. Uh, the reason I say that if you compare a 1.5 meter device to a 25 centimeter device, it is a very different test. And the autoclave really needs to um, remove the air from a very deeper space and replace it with steam sufficiently compared to a 25 centimeter. Once again, if you do not get this uh, air out, you cannot get the steam in. Before I continue on the Sterility Assurance product, I would like to give Shane the opportunity to explain the sear vessel to you. The sear vessel is the first of its kind with a unique, completely glass manufactured chamber. Um, even the boiler is glass manufactured. So it's really nice to see the operation of an autoclave, although it's not exactly the same as an autoclave. It's used to test sterility assurance levels, but I'll give over to Shane and he can go, um, explain all the details to you guys. Thank you, Shane. All right, thank you, Unit. Uh, yes, um, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the CO vessel. The CO vessel was designed to expose microorganisms for biological and chemical indicators to define steam sterilization reference conditions in a range from 110 to 134 degrees. It produces a square wave profile for pressure, vacuum, and temperature under real steam sterilization conditions. Due to the high accuracy, it's particularly suitable for the determination of the activation kinetics, the resistance of the microorganisms, chemical reaction kinetics, and material mm -hmm. behavior. An essential tool for product development, quality control, and process optimization in steam sterilization technologies. The glass sear vessel provides uh, proves extreme advantages in visual monitoring and real-time chemical color changes. Seeing it change is believing. It has a huge beneficial advantage in actual visual visualization of material behavior in product, product development, quality control, and ex extremely supportive for training purposes. Thank you, Yonita. Thank you, Shane. Um, so I'm going to continue with IMPAC uh, indicators. IMPAC indicators, they consist of type 4 short indicator, which is a linear test, type 4 long indicator, which is also linear, your type 5 moving front integrator, which is not a linear test, and then your type 6 emulator indicator, which is also linear. Impact monitoring provides the assurance that effective sterilization conditions were present within each pack, tray, uh, container, wrapped item, where the indicator might be placed. So that's why um, in training, normally they recommend to place your indicator in the middle because that is concerned as the coldest spot in your pack or in your container or tray or so forth. The indicator is not serving any purpose for CSSD as they are enclosed inside packaging and thus they are mostly not visible to CSSD staff. The end user, which is the theater staff or surgical staff, see the physical evidence and they record it either in their theater notes or in their patient notes, therefore providing proof of impact sterility. I just want to look at the different types. I've been talking about type 4, type 5, type 6, so the types might be overwhelming. Um, so I'll just go through them step for, uh, one by one. Type 1 is a process indicator. It is intended for the use at the outside of individual packs, containers, or peel packs. 
So a typical type one indicator will be uh, the indicators on the side of your spherical wheel packs. That's a type one. It doesn't mean that it's met all the parameters or something like that. It's just indicating that it has gone through the autoclave. So um, working on that, you can't say that the uh, it has passed or that the pack is sterile. Your type two is a specific test indicator which consists out of an indicator and a test system like the helix or the tester. So typically that will be your Bowie-Deck indicator. The inside is a type two, your indicator inside, but the challenge is the outside pack. Even your helix, the indicator that you place inside your helix is a type two, but with the challenge, um, it's considered a type two. Uh, the type 4, there's no type 3. The type 4 is a multi-parameter uh, indicator which reacts to two or more critical parameters of sterilization. And then your type 5 integrator, moving integrator, reacts to all critical parameters over a specified range of sterilization cycle. Your type 6 emulator indicator reacts to all critical parameters of a specified range of sterilization cycle. So your type five and type six, um, they are the same. However, the test tests differently. So your type five is a moving front integrator, which is not linear, and your type six is a linear test. So I'm just gonna have a quick overview of all of those mentioned. So your type four indicator, it consists out of a long and a short indicator. Um, they test for sterility temperature too low, sterility temperature too high, holding time too short, holding time too long, insufficient steam penetration and load at the spot where the indicator is placed. It cannot serve to release loads and serves acknowledgement for proper sterilization to operating rooms and staff. And so your type six emulator it tastes the same as your type four, and it's not much different. It can also not serve to release loads and serves acknowledgement for proper sterilization to operating rooms. In your type five chemical integrator, that serves as, um, it has a color that moves from left to right. So here you will actually see the example. This color normally, it will be an open window once it starts getting steam and it starts meeting the uh, correct parameters, it starts moving from left all the way to right. And if it is in the acceptance window, it is a pass. It doesn't have to color full. It can just get into the acceptance window. Then your parameters have been met. Uh, sorry, the type five indicator is a very nice, um, it's easy to anticipate or to understand when you're in theater and you're not quite sure what color it should be or should it be pink or should it be yellow and um, this is not color dependent either so having that in theaters is very easy to understand and interpret we'll go on to the biological indicator the monitoring of sterilization conditions at preferred places with the help of self-contained biological indicators is a practice of everyday use in hospitals worldwide so it is a bacillus in inoculated strip or carrier, which is packed into an ampule inside a plastic vial and is closed or sealed with a lid and a small filter. We often ask hospitals how many times they have a BI with a positive result, meaning outgrowth. The result is that 98% of hospitals do not have any during the course of a year. So the main reason for that is that in a normal pack cycle, the organism is killed within the first 0.7 minutes of the sterilization holding time. We must object, how about the rest of the holding time? And is it really a good test to rely on? So here we've added the killing time to the Jobacillus stereothermophilus, which are lower than the moving front integrators reaching a pass area. So here the BI would have passed already. Only here the 
type five moving front integrator starting to go into the accept window. Then at 2.1 minutes only, it will be uh, fully covered. So can biological indicators replace chemical, um, can chemical indicators replace biological indicators is the question um, most people ask. ISO 1493 clearly explains how to proceed to uh, validate the sterilization process and routine monitoring. In chapter 10.2 says, there shall be evidence through measurements supplemented as necessary by chemical or biological indicators that the sterilization process was delivered within the defined tolerance. There is no ISO or EN standard obligating the BI use. The use of a certain type of chemical indicator and or biological indicator is a free choice. The only mandatory test is the Bowie-Dick test. So what is recommended? So we recommend your first cycle of the day to be a warm-up cycle, or if you don't have a warm-up cycle on your autoclave, just to run an empty cycle for any non-condensable gases that may have accumulated during the night, or even if your autoclave is switched off at night, just to warm up the door as well as the rest of the autoclave. Your second cycle will be to run your Bowie Dick test pack as a daily uh, autoclave verification. Then thirdly, your helix batch control device needs to be placed in every single cycle as your batch control or load monitor. So that is for specifically for your CSSB stock. And um, if it has passed, they can confidently release the rest of their load Bearing in mind, though, that the type 5 moving front integrator still needs to be placed in each and every single pack. That's not for CSSD, it's still for the operating room staff to acknowledge proper sterilization. So in conclusion, key points to look at when releasing a load as sterile. So uh, obviously you'll firstly look at your autoclave printout. Does it say that it's a uh, pass? Is it saying a failure? Then the next thing to look at is wig packs. Are all your packs dry? And if they are not dry, it needs to be reprocessed. So over here in this picture, you can see a nice wet puddle over there. A wet pack is considered an unsterile pack. So this is unsterile, which will be reprocessed. And to check your batch control monitoring device is a crucial step in releasing your loads as sterile. Um, if it shows a pass, then you can confidently release your load. However, if it doesn't show a pass and it shows a failure, you can uh, reprocess your items in CCC, knowing that it shows a fail with, before you've even sent them to theater. So it does um, limit recalls and reprocessing. In summary, when using a Helix device for batch monitoring, you can be sure that it is the chemical indicator has changed to the end color. The steam sterilizer effectively has proven its capability to sterilize. The inside and the outside are the most challenging instruments, instrument trays and containers. So a wet pack tip is um, Plastic trays never dry. There's not enough energy to store or to promote oil off. The silicon spaces help separate the condensate. However, the simple principle is that the condensation energy uh, equals the evaporation energy and that it is basic reason why you will always have a dry load. For the condensate to be able to drain the energy from the materials, it needs to be in contact with those instruments or objects. The fact that you have a wet load problem is because the condensate has been separated from the evaporation energy, the in, uh, instruments or the device inside. Uh, I just want to, another thing that causes wet loads is uh, poor steam quality. And I'm gonna give Shane again the chance to explain uh, poor steam quality and what it is, what's the cause of it and so forth. 
All right, thanks, Unito. So when it comes to first team quality, I, I can sit here all day and talk about it. First team quality, mainly you look at water, poor water quality. So if you have poor water quality, you, you're going to have a problem with your steam quality. So, uh, poor steam quality may impair sterilization process and can have a negative effect on equi equipment and limit the types of loads that can be sterilized. So for this reason, we suggest maximum purity levels of the feed water to the autoclave. Steam sterilization uses saturated steam to heat surgical instruments and achieve sterilization. The steam encounters the items placed inside of the autoclave and passes through the fax wrapping and heats the instruments inside of the fax. For this reason, the steam must be free of impurities in order to avoid st staining, cordoning, recontaminating, re and interfering of the items being autoclaved. We need to prevent such contaminants from affecting the actual sterility outcome and the chemicals indicators. The quality of water is used in the quality of water used in autoclaves can also affect the autoclave's performance and lifetime, and can lead to premature component failure and increase service intervals. The following water contaminants may have negative effects on autoclaves. So we have ions, metals, particles. Um, all of those we can have. Um, we will have the uh, deposits in the steam generator or in the instrument and alter their functions. They may also contaminate the solutions or instruments being autoclaved. So we'll also find that your pipes will block up and your heat exchangers will block up and that will have more problems and it will restrict water flow and reduce, um, uh, sorry, and uh, yeah. So, and then we must look at bacteria and their products. The level of bacteria and endotoxins should be minimized in the feed water of the autoclave as there is a risk that they may deposit onto the items being autoclaved, although the steam sterilization inactivate, inactivates bacteria. It does not fully inactivate their byproducts, such as endotoxins, and may infect experiments such as cell culture or patient care by causing inflammation and delaying wound healing. And then the last thing is chlorides, which we, we get that a lot in the field lately, as everybody is pouring chlorides into the tanks lately. Uh, it lowers the steam efficiency when present in large quantities that lead to uneven steam delivery and may provoke foaming in the steam generator and cause corrosion to all aesthetical stainless steel leading to material failure. So it means even your autoclave, the stainless steel of the autoclave could grow, uh, which would also then shorten the lifetime of the autoclave, including the instruments. All right, and then if we look at the table that will follow, we will also see the European EN285 2015 and it should be in the United States. Both suggest maximum water impurity levels for steam supply feed water as summarized in the table. If it's not fit for human consumption, it certainly will not be fit for steam sterilization. Thank you, Shane. Um, the last bit, it's just a closing word. Uh, so we all have a definite responsibility toward future patient safety and can only do something about it if we firstly acknowledge the magnitude of the problem. Without sterile packs or instruments, the hospital would come to a still stand faster than a bullet hitting a brick wall. This is unfortunately a true reality as patients in Africa are already spreading their wings to other countries seeking proper medical care. Although the autoclaves have been placed under maintenance department's responsibility for many years, they are now classified as a medical device. The CSSD equipment like the instrument washer, plasma sterilizer, endoscope cabinet, and even benchtop sterilizers are already under clinical engineers' responsibility. Considering the importance of an autoclave and infection control, should the autoclaves not also be placed under the clinical engineer's responsibility? I trust that you all found the webinar informing and that the knowledge gained will be put to good use. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Anita and Shane, for that very interesting presentation. Okay, I don't see any questions, but um, um, I think one last point you made, which I think we can take home, is that uh, if it's not fit for human consumption, it certainly is not fit for steam sterilization. That's one thing I'm taking home with me today. But otherwise, thank you so much, um, Yanita and Shane, for the presentation. And thank you to all the participants and even the TUT students who were able to attend the presentation. 
Um, it is recorded and um, the admin will make it available as and when uh, the recording is ready, hopefully to be uploaded in the KISA YouTube channel, uh, which I uh, strongly advise you to subscribe to. But thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening. I'll see you again next month when we have another monthly KISA webinar. Thank you.